Hi, everyone. I'm Kristen Bell from the Strategic Development Team here at Adobe. Uh, welcome to Soda Series Live. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm usually joined by Tom Beck, Executive Director of Soda. Uh, but unfortunately, he is battling the aftermath of the blizzard that hit the Midwest and you know, is, is battling other states now. Um, so anyway, we're thinking of you, Tom, and hope that you and your family are staying safe and warm. Uh, for those joining us for the first time, Soda Series Live is a collaboration between Adobe and Soda, the Society of Digital Agencies, where we bring you in-depth conversations with design and creative leaders from all around the world. And we invite you to be a part of these conversations. Uh, so if you're joining us live today, say hi in the chat. Feel free to drop some questions in there. Uh, today, we're super excited to have a conversation around inclusive design. Um, and yeah, so let us know if you have questions um, relative to that, maybe some of the challenges that you might face when designing for inclusivity or uh, just what's top of mind for you around inclusive design. Uh, so with that, let's get started. I'd love to introduce Talon Wadsworth from the Adobe Design Team. Hey, Talon. Hey, Kristen. Talon's been involved in some of Adobe's most exciting uh, product design initiatives here at Adobe and brings a wealth of not only knowledge and expertise to the conversations, but also just an immense passion um, for design and community connection. Uh, so as always, Talon, we're super thrilled to have you as a partner in the series. So thank you. Oh. Thanks, Kristen. And thank you so nice for that lovely introduction. And again, my pleasure. Like there's nothing I love more than being able to talk about those passions that I have and okay. design being one of the biggest. So it always shines. excited to be here. Thanks. It always shines. So thank you. Um, and then I also have the privilege of introducing our guest, um, Ben Messeros. I'm going to totally botch that again. I'm sorry, Ben. Um, it's all right. You can say whatever you want. Any like <laughs> string of syllables together works. You're yeah. sweet and so forgiving. <laughs> Uh, ben is partner and chief experience officer at Ohm Studios, and Ohm is a digital product strategy and design studio dedicated to creating exclusive, inclusive user experiences. Uh, they work with some of the most, the world's most innovative and progressive tech brands, and are on a mission to create a world that's both accessible and beneficial to all. Uh, so Ben brings a sincere passion for inclusivity and, and uh, loads of experience from our conversations um, to this conversation. So buckle in and get ready to absorb all the goodness today. Uh, I'm going to drop off camera and I'll be in the LinkedIn chat to service any questions for Talon and Ben during the show. Uh, so everyone watching, I'll see you there. And Talon and Ben, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thanks so much, Kristen. Well, Ben, I'm so excited to, to talk with you. Um, one of the biggest reasons being that we share a connection. And I don't know if a lot of the people who've joined me, you know, here on the stream over the years know this about me, but I am originally from Salt Lake City myself. From We are, we are both Utahns, as it yeah. were. <laughs> so we're just going to get that out of the way first. Um, you out yeah. of us already. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, he's like when I, you know, like uh, it's always nice to connect with talented people from from the home state. Um, it's a unique place, to say the least, uh, and a place that I know just still kind of runs deep within my 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 blood and DNA. So uh, always always excited to connect with talented people from 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 Utah. So we're excited to be speaking with you today. Also, we share another really interesting, we, uh, first, we always kick off by like talking about kind of your individual journey, you know, like how you came to kind of be where you're at and kind of the different places, steps along the way. But uh, we also share uh, a fact that like we were both uh, haunting the record stores and, and of Salt Lake City, oh, you yeah. know, the past, you know, what, 15, 20 years ago. And so uh, I also really excited to talk to, to hear a little bit more about that. So, um, so yeah, so kick us off. Tell us a little bit about yourself and about your creative journey and kind of how you ended up kind of where you're at today at OM Studios. Yeah. I mean, OM is a fully distributed company coast to coast in the U S we used to have, um, roots in, in the mission in San Francisco had an office mm -hmm. there and then one in Brooklyn. And then during the pandemic, spread out. And that's when I joined. So I'm the only person here in Salt Lake City. I've been here for a long time. Um, man, I started out like my senior year of high school. Uh, I, you know, graduated early and got a job at a record store uh, called Graywell here in Salt Lake City, mm -hmm. which is one the talent knows. 
Uh, it's sort of like the amoeba of Utah in a very small, tiny Utah way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and man, I loved it. It was so much fun and uh, had a lot of like creative outlet. I spent every cent of my uh, paycheck on records and CDs and that sort of thing, um, which wasn't a lot because as a manager, I got paid like 20K a year with no benefits. So I had like no money at all anyway. Uh, you know, so eventually that was my like early 20s. I dropped out of school, uh, out of college to just like focus on the record store, which turned out to be a bad idea, but I still loved it and had a great experience. Uh, you know, and then decided at, at some point in time, you know, I think being an adult is a thing I should think about. So maybe I'll get a, a job somewhere that, uh, you know, has benefits and maybe a little bit better pay. All I knew was management retail. So I got a job at Starbucks as a manager that like doubled my pay, which still wasn't very much. But I got benefits and like right. stock options, all these other things, like adult things that felt pretty good. Uh, did that for many years. And then at some point in time decided like, I don't actually like getting up at 4am. And I don't think this is going to pay very much long term. Uh, and I want to do something else with my life. So I went back to school, went to the University of Utah, basically studied Marshall McLuhan for four years. Uh, oh, yeah, life, you know, just so like, do dove way deep into the deep end of like communications, how people uh, transfer meaning. Um, and loved it, like absolutely mm -hmm. loved my time at the U and had a much different experience because I was there for myself. Yeah. After that, I wanted to do something very creative. So I got a job at a, a full service agency called the Summit Group. Mm -hmm. um, and by full service, I mean like traditional full service, right? Everything yeah. from media buying to, to creative, to development, to like, I mean, you name it, they did it. Um, did that for a number of years, loved the people I worked with, like really cut my teeth on like what creative design looks like and how to run a business and, and all of that sort of thing, especially creative business, uh, client service, you know, the whole nine yards. Mm -hmm. um, eventually decided that I didn't want to travel six months out of the year and that I didn't want to sell things like Subway sandwiches and Verizon phones for the rest of my life. That was like, I'd sort of like gotten what I needed out of it. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, narrowed into like, oh, I actually like really like product design a lot more, which is something we did a bit of. We did a bit of like user experience design at the summit group, but decided that was something I really cared about and something that was really interesting to me. I liked solving real problems for real people and seeing the impact of it. Um, and that felt more meaningful to me than just at straight advertising. Um, <clears throat> personally, that's how it felt. So yeah. I had a job at another uh, local shop here called Underbelly, which had just been founded by um, a good friend, Anthony Lagoon. And they were just focused on product design and development. And so it was a small shop when I first joined. We grew that to like 40 or 50 people by the time I left. And I eventually decided like I wanted to specialize even more outside mm -hmm. of, you know, broad end to end product design, development, marketing. They still did like a lot of things like I would say full service product agency. But what I really wanted to do is like specialize even more. So I got into just product design. And then I had met a good friend, Rob Young, um, mm -hmm. through another friend, Mike Buzzard, who at the time was working at Google and was like working on getting a bunch of agencies together in order to share ideas and to help each other do better. Um, rising tides rises all ships or whatever that saying is. That was mm -hmm. the whole mantra. <laughs> and so yeah. I met Rob there and like we instantly hit it off. I really loved their approach to work and to design and loved the speciality of the of the firm itself you know and they just did product design they didn't do other parts of it they were like really wanted to to nail that for their clients um and so i came there during the pandemic uh during 2020 um joined in november of 2020 and have been here since nice nice well that's yeah. it. i mean I, I i love hearing you kind of run through your journey and there's so many touch points in there um again i think we kind of came up in that kind of same cohort and but one thing I wanted to touch on real quick is that the Graywell connection. So, uh, were you, so there's, I, I started my design at Salt Lake Community College, which was oh, yeah. right Slick down the street awesome. from, from a, from a Graywell yep. and, uh, also CD warehouse. Do you remember CD warehouse oh, yeah. as well? That tiny little mm -hmm. joint. Um, I don't know if you ever knew Kyle who ran that shop there. Oh yeah. yeah. Dude, and basically the only, there are two Graywells still left and there's yeah. one Randy's records, you know, and that's mm -hmm. sort of the that's local the, record yeah. scene that still yeah, exists. I mean, there's more than that in Salt Lake there's, but 
but those are the ones that are left over from that. Yeah, I'm era. pretty I'm pretty positive you and I cross paths at sometimes because any free time or money I had, I was either at Graywell or CD Warehouse. So yeah, or designing good, good rock and roll uh, yeah. posters and stuff. Exactly. Know? I mean, that's that was the my start in uh, in design. Really, was at Slick where I you know took a Photoshop for design class. Yeah, I was you know I was on my path to go be an architect at the U, and then I was like, why would I go spend like six years like just like doing like just toiling away at that and i could just go and design like all these things behind me here so i'm like right. oh, i'm gonna go do that so so yeah i definitely i was uh would have loved to design posters like kilby court back in the early days and stuff like that that would have been that would have been a dream but uh yeah i mean kilby's uh, having their anniversary uh concert pretty soon you should come check That's it out right. but That's yeah right. i think what to take away from this conversation for people is yeah. maybe like what your path and your career is going to lead many different places many that you can't ways. foresee you know yeah. and be okay 100%. with that you know? yeah 100 percent. i always like digging into it a little bit and just giving in like i remember growing up in utah one of the hard things was having a model right something that i could look at and say oh that's how someone makes money and is successful doing this thing that, that I love to do. I didn't really have an outlet for that. And it was really again, kind of eye-opening to sort of go to go to Slick and kind of end up there and be like, oh, people can do that. People can can make money that way. They can have a career that way. And it was something that I didn't get a lot of exposure to, I think, growing up in Utah. With, now it's much different. Like people are being exposed much yeah. to, to things all over the world in a much more immediate and direct way. But uh, yeah, so that's also kind of cool is that we both kind of found our way without having like a, like a definite model out there to be like, Oh, I, this is how, this is someone I look up to and someone I can follow in the path of to, to can kind of figure out what is, what is it that I want to do? You know? Yeah. I mean, that's part of the reason why I think inclusion and access matters so much to us is because yeah. like you, you can only follow the opportunities that you see or have access to or inspired by. And so <clears throat> how the world around you is designed is so important and meaningful for the opportunities that exist for you and the career yeah. paths you can pursue and choose. And I think we're getting there as a society, but it's, you know, there's still a lot of work to do. Yeah. Still a lot of people being left out, left behind or not included at all. And so, yeah, what potential are we missing out on? But before right. we kind of dig into that, cause I love this topic and I, I was really excited to speak with it, with you about it today. Give us just for the audience here who maybe haven't been exposed to uh, what we mean when we say inclusive design Maybe just let's let's set a baseline. Just kind mm. of from your perspective, how do you define inclusive design, right? And what yep. is that inclusive of? We'll say as well. So yeah, um, <clears throat> that's a great question. I think it's important to sort of understand that there there are really great important conversations going on right now uh, about terminology in this world. And mm -hmm. I mean this mm -hmm. this is ongoing in in many different sectors and in all yeah. parts of life, right? Words matter. What we mean by what we say matters and having good in, in conversations about how to be as intentional and meaningful and um, respectful with the words that we use and um, having that drive the kind of work that we do and how we do work is important. Mm -hmm. And so like, there's a lot of great conversation about like, what does inclusive design mean versus universal design per se, mm -hmm. or human centered design versus inclusive design or accessibility and how does that fit into that or, or equitable design. Um, yeah. is one of the most meaningful conversations that's happening right now is like equitable design versus inclusive design. So there's mm -hmm. a, there's a lot of of important terminology that's that's being discussed here. And the implications of it are also important. For purposes mm -hmm. of today's discussion, I think it's it, that it, it's important to say like the heart of all those things is really similar. And so what we're going to use as a term today is inclusive design, and that's okay. And that's going to evolve and change. And eventually, like how we refine these sorts of concepts is going to be important. And then we're going to get to that place, and then we're going to refine that, and then get to another mm -hmm. place and refine that. So the terminology matters, and it's going to change. But yeah, what we mean by inclusive design. Like our, our mission at OM is to create a world that's accessible and beneficial to all by using design as a tool for bettering people's lives. So um, it, it sort of started off for us a couple of years ago during the pandemic. Well, let me back up. <clears throat> um, so what we mean and what I mean by that is that the products that we build, the problems that we solve actually solve problems for the people who need to use them. Mm -hmm. And that we're we're going out of our way to think about ex excluded communities, people who need to use that product but can't or excluded in some way, shape or form. Mm -hmm. And how do we build that? They'll build the product specifically for those people and in a way that actually makes it better for everybody on the whole. 
Mm-hmm. And so like where this started for us at OM, like I mentioned, I'd come to OM initially because I was really interested in, in focusing just on UI, UX design, interaction design, product design, you know, and, and just that and not other pieces of, of the product world. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was our, already a part of like OM's mantra. But <clears throat> one of the things that we were wrestling with at the beginning of the pandemic that a lot of people were, were like, okay, what are we doing with our lives? You know, like... <laughs> Yes, we're specialized in this world, but like we're sort of like met head on with with a lot of existential questions that are important to ask that maybe we didn't have the space or time or pressure to ask in the first place. And so we decided as, you know, as a team, like that is also important, not just for us to do as individuals, but as a company. And mm-hmm. um, it's it's particularly difficult at an agency, right, where the historical value proposition of agencies or the historical thing that you do for agencies is like do the best work possible for your clients and make money doing it. But that's, I mean, that's not really all that compelling once you like break it down to its component parts in terms Mm -hmm. of like having fulfillment in your life and to use the terminology sort of loose, like having a legacy that you want to leave behind. Like what's, what's the positive impact I want to make in the world. Um, And if you're lucky in a creative space, you sort of get that by, um, by working with clients who have missions or values or, or products that are doing that and you adopt mm-hmm. those things temporarily. Right. So working with a, a, a company that's like environmentally minded and is solving big environmental problems. Great. I get to do that for like three, six months a year and then poof gone moving on to something else. So what we decided is, is what is something, what is a mission that we can adopt that we can bring to every single project, regardless that we feel like is, is, moving forward some sort of of cause or mission or something that's beyond ourselves that we can get out of bed in the morning and be excited about and Mm -hmm. feel like we're making a difference and inspire people and i i I, like i i'm fully bought into the idea that like business leaders their job is to create is to do two things one is to solve problems for people like actually create a business that solves an actual problem that benefits the world and two is to create an, an environment or a business that has that creates fulfilling meaningful work for the people who you're working with. Right. Yeah. And so we, as a leadership team, we dove super deep into like um, a bunch of like books on uh, this topic, like primarily Simon Sinek's um, infinite game. Many people have mm-hmm. probably read his work. Like if you, if you work in the creative world and you haven't read start with why, please do that yesterday, you know, like that's yeah. a pretty standard for, for the core business uh, of, of doing creative work. But so we, we thought about like, okay, what is something that we can do that is going, that we can bring to every client and that is going to make a difference for our people. And um, that is, is agnostic of the type of work that we're doing for, or the type of business that we're engaging with. And we landed on inclusive design for many reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, okay. I guess I'll pause there. I went but, down a rabbit trail, but no, does that I, answer I, your question? Like, what do we mean sort of by inclusive design? Why did OM care about it in the first yeah, place? Yeah, no, no. I think it's a great sort of start. And I, I wanted to get back to something that I think you you touched on in in there, which is um, having, again, like like defining your values or your principles um, can, can build a really strong foundation for you to then, again, it, it's a way to both like say yes to the work that you want to do, but also say no to the work that does not align with those values. And I, I think there was something interesting you said about, if your goal, if your sort of foundational idea is to make money, right, uh, you'd leave a lot of unanswered questions there and it can take you down kind of different paths, right? And then you, you end up sort of doing work for the sole benefit of making money. And, and that can end up, you know, we can end up in problematic spaces, you know, due to that, you know, you could be doing work that, you know, might, you know, again, in the, in the worst case scenario, be unethical, you know, in a way, again, when you're focused on kind of the wrong priorities or again, your priority is sort of excluding, you know, other potential sort of paths or value. And so what I like about what you're saying um, is that, you know, informing that foundation and having that, you know, I think about almost like a manifesto, right? That this is the type of work that we do and this is the type of work that we value. Thus, we're going to ensure that the work that we take on for clients is aligned with those values or those principles or that sort of founding sort of idea or manifesto. Um, has you know, Give me an example of the type of work then that, that really comes in to, to OM Studios that, um, again, you know, the things that types of project that you do work on and the things that you you do consider and take on um, and how that, again, like 
how those decisions again impact you know kind of the the work and kind of the vibes and the and the uh, the morale of the team overall. Yeah, I mean, I think what you described is important. Like the <clears throat> everybody who gets in design almost almost exclusively, I mean, at some point in time, has seen the world and seen something in the world that could have been designed better. And they're not content with just leaving it there, right? That's yeah. like the incredible thing about designers is there's like optimistic pessimists, right? They see like a problem that exists in the world. They've come across something where they something didn't work like it was supposed to. And they not, are not content with just sitting by and saying, okay, fine, that's I'm okay with that. They say, no, I want to become a designer so I can design things that don't present this problem to people. And I think like the, the realization for most people when you start to really care about things like inclusive design is when you realize how many other people are excluded from experiences and from how things are designed. Yeah. And you're like that passion inside of you that brought you to be a designer in the first place, like awakens again, where you see all of these ways mm -hmm. where people are being excluded from experiences from the world and yeah. you want to do something about it. Um, for OM, I think the way we, we thought about it, um, so two things that are helpful here that people can check out if they're interested is like, I wrote an article <clears throat> on our medium page a while ago about how we decide which projects we take on. Mm -hmm. Part of it is like values alignment, expertise alignment, et cetera. And part of it is like an opportunity for us to grow our inclusive design expertise because mm -hmm. part of like one of the biggest parts of inclusive design is being humble, right? Like just understanding that there's a ton you don't know. And that there's a ton that you that you've done in the past that's not been helpful for for communities and use the products that you're designing, and being willing to learn, being willing to listen, to ask questions, to include people that you wouldn't have included in in the first place in your product design uh, processes. And so we, so that's a helpful thing to look at is like this is this is how we decide which projects we take on, and then we also decided like we want to be able to bring these principles to everybody to every project mm -hmm. that that aligns with at least aligns with their values doesn't clash with our values there's certain companies we wouldn't work with just because they don't align with who we are as a company period mm -hmm. um i won't get into that but i outline it in that article yeah. um yeah so what we did was instead of saying oh we're only going to take on projects that have obvious inclusive design needs every product every project has inclusive design needs if you're designing for people you have inclusive design needs end of yeah. story and so what we did was design a series of principles over this last year that we can bring to all of our projects. Those are outlined on our on our studio site if you want to check it out. Uh, this om.co slash studio. Um, but it's those principles that we then bring to all of our projects. And we, we kick off every one of our projects with our clients saying, here are our principles that we bring. And these are the lenses that we're going to look through as we do work. Mm -hmm. And 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 that is going to inform the decisions we make. It's going to inform the process that we build bespoke for each one of our projects. Yeah. 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 And again, having that down and having that clear is ideally helping you attract those clients that, that already kind of, at least from a, at least from a, like a high level align with those principles, you're sort of stating it out there and saying, look, this is what we offer and this is how we work. And this is the principles upon which we, we build that work. And do you find that it, 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 you just happen to attract a lot of like those clients that are already at least from a, from a high level, at least aligned with, with the work that you want to be doing? Yeah, I think, I mean, most certainly, right? So yeah. one of the best ways that you can attract the right types of people is be forward about who you are and your expertise yeah. and the people who care about it. You'll have fertile soil to have those conversations with. Um, it's, it's tricky because right now, um, in in tech there's a lot especially especially in tech in the economy in general but especially in tech that's getting hit really hard um like these are the first kinds of things to go in, in yeah, people's 100%. priority lists right yeah. like um and i get it to some extent like you're you're scared you're looking at your pnl you're on, you're, you're looking at the into the future and all like you just get n hardcore focused on okrs and that's mm -hmm. it right yeah. um and so things like inclusive design um people in stages like this um, care about it in, in practice and they want to care about it. I really do believe people want to care about it, but they're just so over inundated by everything else in business and all the things they're worried about, um, that it seems super daunting to think about like, well, I, I just have a business to run. I, mm -hmm. How could I care about these nice to have things? Right. So yeah. I think that's the hardest part about the current economy that we're in right now is that, um, things like diversity, inclusion, inclusive design, checking for accessibility, those things become afterthoughts. Yeah. Um, 
they're not built into the process like at the moment, right? You said like yep. because of the priorities, the priorities really flow out to the then the the requirements, right? As yep. it were, sort of being defined. Like these are the things that we need. These are things we have to have. This is our MVP, and again, like our the values define the priorities in a way. Yep. And if we're sort of fully focused on the values of business and of hitting those OKRs, and then again abstracted from the actual people behind those numbers, right? When we're not being inclusive of them, we're sort of missing a whole potential stream of work and also potentially value, long-term value, right? Yep. Yeah. And and I mean, be, beyond that, like how people are personally held accountable for their work and how they're going to yeah. get a review, like probably doesn't include any of this stuff at all, right? And so if you're just Great like point. in self-preservation mode, because half your team just got axed in a layoff, like this is not something that you have the time or space to really care about. The dangerous thing about this current environment, though, is that, you know, like it, <laughs> the, it, it's it's sort of counterintuitive, but the, these are the types of problems that if you solve them right, it is it is a better product experience for your entire Everyone. user base, period. Yeah. Right. And they're. Yeah enormous examples about this in the physical real world and in the digital world, right? Like the simplest, most like baseline example of this is like sloping curves so that people with accessibility needs can get up on a curb off of a mm -hmm. street. That's like inclusive design 101. Yeah. Better for everybody in the end, right? Yeah. Um, and so in the, in the long game, especially in the long game, the, the the companies that really do invest in things like inclusive design right now are the companies that are going to build vastly superior products mm -hmm. to their competitors and they're going to win in the end. So if you yeah. if you actually care about business decision if you actually care about your bottom line, you're not going to give up on these sorts of things right now. And I mean there're plenty of case studies from the dot com bubble and from the 2008 recession for companies that invested specifically in design when others weren't where they crushed the competition or where they were founded during those periods and really focused on design and creating products that were very usable and, and um, accessible and solved real problems. And there are companies now that are like doing incredibly well, you mm -hmm. know, and part of the other thing that like really scares me about this specific time is if you, if you pull back on that sort of stuff, like decisions you make um, in product have a tendency to stick for a really long time yeah, and have they a hard, they have a hard true. time changing. Right. So, like Jaron Lanier talks about this in his book, You're Not a Gadget. If you haven't read it, it's super great. It was probably like 10 or 12 years ago um, about how like decisions in design and, and in product and in tech are made very quickly and they stick and they're very hard to change. Very a good example of this is like the file structure in computers is is was made by a couple of people in a matter of a week, like yeah. how folders are structured in computers and that's stuck and is not going anywhere, right? Like no. as long as I'm human sad. beings are human beings, that's how computers are going to be structured. But yeah. that's not actually how human beings brains work. We work in networks of information, things that are like connected in different ways. They're not in discrete folders that run down. And so, but a decision was made in two seconds by a couple of dudes in a room years and years and years ago is something we're still dealing with. Mm -hmm. So the product decisions you're making as a company right now, if you're not focused on including, excluding communities, those decisions are going to stick for way longer than you think they are. And it's going to create problems that are going to be incredibly hard, if not impossible to solve in the future. Yeah. Yeah. I hundred percent agree with that. And you and I were, I love where you started in terms of like, like to define inclusivity, you know, looking for models, right. That, that maybe are external from you know, kind of your, your scene or your profession, your sort of specialty, right? If you're working in tech, how do we look to the real world, sort of the physical world for models that can help us build the case, the foundation, like this is why inclusivity matters. This is why it supports the majority of people um, over time, right? You're building up that durable foundation of users that, that you can support um, instead of just sort of looking for these like quick wins, these sort of quick spikes in OKRs that are very short term focused. Instead, we're sort of building that foundation for, for the long haul. You know, so in that, again, I, we get a lot of designers, I think you know, younger, younger designers, you know, people who are looking to, to get into the industry, uh, you're looking for guidance. What are some things that, that you could recommend to help them bring more inclusivity you know, into their daily practice? And then things they can yeah. also do to have an impact, right? Like if, if their companies or, or their teams aren't prioritizing, right, you know, they're still prioritizing the short-term gains, they're still prioritizing OKRs, and that's how we're going to be judged. 
what are some things I could put into practice, you know, in my, in my day to day, you know, as a designer kind of working on these projects? Yeah. Good question. Um, so we've talked about this before, Talon and, and, yeah. um, the, the, the last decade or two decades maybe, um, of time for designers has been figuring out how do we have a seat at the table, quote unquote, like I can't count yeah. the number of times I've had this conversation with people or heard this conversation. And, um, I think what designers have learned to do, which is good, is to be able to make a business case for the thing you're trying to do, right? Mm -hmm. um, what's dangerous about that and what has happened, I think, or a trend that is is has been building over time is that designers become so focused on OKRs that they are they sometimes struggle to connect things like inclusive design or the 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 problems they're trying to solve for real people to OKRs in a way that convinces leadership that this is the right thing to invest in. Yeah. And instead just become caught up in the like, did this drive engagement or not? Right. As a, as an example, like I I'm a full believer that like there aren't evil people at working at big tech yeah. that are trying to ruin society. That's not the case. It's yeah. seemingly benign OKRs that people are, are following because they don't have time or, or, uh, uh, or the energy to do other things or mm -hmm. the, like th there are many reasons why, but, but it, it is struggling to get back to that core problem that we were trying, that we were talking about before, which is like, you got into design in the first place because you saw a problem in the real world that affected real people and you wanted to do something about it. And now you've got to figure out how to continue to do that in a way that justifies the cost to the people that you're working with. And so for inclusive design, I think there's a lot of, um, a lot of conversation that needs to happen, a lot of hard work that needs to happen about how doing that is actually setting yourself, setting yourself up and the product long term for much greater mm -hmm. success. It's avoiding mm -hmm. all sorts of design debt and technical debt that you're going to have to fix later on. And like, I think everybody's human. They want to, they want to know that the work they're doing is actually going to make a difference in the real world, right? So. Yeah connecting to the human part of, of the business decision you you're, you're making is important as well. Um, in, in terms of like practical things that you can do, like the principles that we have as a company in order to, um, that, that we bring to each one of our project and then figure out how do we apply these principles to this specific client. One is to center in excluded communities. That's probably the most important thing you do. You can do here. Right. So yeah. like Kat Holmes in her mismatch in her book mismatch, which if you haven't read it, you should, um, there are a bunch of resources I think we've compiled that we'll share at the end of this. Um, but that's one yes. of them is designed for one extent to many. It's an easy mm -hmm. thing to remember and it makes a ton of sense. So, and we can see this in like the physical world all over the place and places that have prioritized it and where it makes mm -hmm. a better um, world for everybody, not just the people who actually needed that specific part of the design. Curb design being one of them, right? Um, uh, you know, like uh, one other example we were discussing previously was like uh, the design of of physical money and having different mm -hmm. sizes of those uh, those bills so that it's easier to understand for everybody in the community yeah. what sort of money you have in your pocket, right? So yeah. centering excluded communities and designing for them specifically and then extending to many after that makes a lot more sense rather than designing for the bell curve. Yeah, um, and then like having making, to change it afterwards right? right so you sort of yeah yeah exactly um our second principle is to honor people's agency um mm -hmm. which is empowering people through flexible and transparent experiences um innovating with intention which means interrogating existing conventions to innovate responsibly taking responsibility as designers so being accountable for the real world consequence real world consequences of the things we design yeah. And then trying to set a new standard with each one of our decisions. So like starting with accessibility and creating experiences that affirm people. Um, and then that becoming the new standard, right? Yeah. Um, we see this all the time in physical, um, real world. I, I think like physical products, spaces, a, a lot of places in Europe that we've talked about, like Amsterdam and London and whatnot, have done a great job here. So like constantly looking at like the decisions that those people have made and how they got to the places they, they got to is important. And mm -hmm. that's where I'm really excited now is like, how do we transfer a lot of the good work that's been done in the physical world to the digital world? Yeah. Yeah. The, the, that first one that you, I, I sort of jawed something down as you were saying, kind of, we sort of jumped into this, but that first topic, you know, really about sort of broadening, like who you talk to and the types of experiences yep. you're being exposed to. 
I think that, that to me is, a, is one of those foundational things. I, I, you know, I say to my own team, you know, I don't have a lot of, uh, uh, currency in personas necessarily sure. because I feel yeah. like you can like early in the process, we can get a little too locked in right in that need for efficiency or productivity, or can we like hit these OKRs? Absolutely. We've got yep. to nail these MVPs that we can sometimes narrow our focus too soon. Right. And so we can end up building an experience to your point that is really tailored towards one type of experience or one type of capability sets instead of kind of broadening and really maybe taking that leap of imagination to say, well, who could we who could potentially be approaching this product or this service and who are we missing out on? Could we broaden the opportunity here? And I think that really starts, you know, foundationally with research and really defining and, uh, and again, investigating a set of experiences that go beyond like one specific persona that you may have identified early on in the process. Right. So I really like that because again, like we bring our experiences to bear. And so, you know, we tend to we're humans. We tend to only really care about the things that you know, our own experiences and things that we've been exposed to. And it does take a bit of a, a bit of work, right. To look beyond that, to look beyond those, those sort of narrow or sort of specific experiences. And I really like that you sort of said that. I think that's something that a lot of people can take action on right now is say, okay, well, if you've thought about this group of people, have you thought about another group of people, you know, how, and how they relate or could connect to this problem that you're trying to solve? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm glad you brought that specific point up about like certain kinds of processes, like personas, et cetera. Um, I mean, all of those things have been created to like put some some structure to the chaos of the creative yes. process. Yeah, yeah right? exactly. Yeah. Um, and 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 also to create efficiencies through process. And the dangerous thing about the, the good thing about that is that it like helps us organize information as human beings mm -hmm. and helps us like get work done. Um, that's important. But um, something I've been ref reflecting on a lot recently on this subject is um, this guy Blair ends so if you haven't read his stuff and you're in the agency or, or creative worlds um, or if you run like a, a business or creative business or a freelancer you should definitely check him out David C Baker and Blair ends do an incredible podcast called two Bobs and Blair's been talking a lot about this thing that he calls the NF in uh, inefficiency inefficiency problem the inefficacy problem I forget mm. he like mm -hmm. made up a word for it I think I can't remember but basically he's talking about how like process is is the enemy of creativity and that in order to do really good work, you have to sort of be okay with having some inefficiencies in your processes and that yeah. the longer a, a business is around, the more process they create, the more structure I'm they sorry. create, and the more yeah. it starts to degrade your ability to think creatively and to do work like this. Inclusive design fits into this very well because you, you have to like put aside some of the processes like personas and do the less processed, less efficient work of including excluded communities into mm -hmm. your process and having conversations with people again, right? Like, mm -hmm. in, like the, the vast majority of times where people have been excluded and then leads to mismatch, uh, mismatch product design decisions are because they just didn't have the people who were necessary to be in the room to help make those yeah. decisions. This is yeah. inclusive design 101, right? So like yeah. the perfect example of this, or like there are many good examples of this. I mean, bad examples of this, I guess it's not good, but you know, um, I, I, I distinctly remember my son is, my son's black. We went to a bathroom and he tried to use the um, soap dispenser and couldn't because it has a hard time reading darker skin tones. This is a well-known mm -hmm. fact, a, a big oversight by the people who designed it. Definitely not um, a, not a malicious, that, not a malicious yeah, design decision. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, phone cameras, another classic another example one. of this. Yeah. Um, uh, and there are many, 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 many other examples. But it, that was a result of just not having included the right types of people who are historically excluded from experiences or um, communities that have been marginalized that are not a part of these spaces. And so that's like inclusive design 101 is you got to like include those people. And that takes a bit of time yes. and it's a little less efficient, but it will lead to much better creative decisions than the end lead to much better products, which is, you know, what we want to do in the first place, but also like much more marketable, like, I mean, for the business minded person, like you're going to be able to sell to way more people and your business is also going to be future proofed because one of the other core tenets of inclusive design is guess what? Everybody has inclusive needs 
and everybody's going to be ex excluded at some point, right? I like yeah. we are all only temporarily abled. And, and, and that, that <clears throat> that's such a that's such a that's such an elegant thought. And it was only recently that I had been exposed to that that sort of foundational tenant of of disabled thought, which is that at some point we will all be disabled, mm -hmm. right? That, that is such a that, that is the case. Like we will all age, and we will all change and have to adapt. And the question is, is is our society set up to help us, right? Like it may have been more so in the past than it is today. It may be more so in other places outside of the US. And that all comes down to like, what are we prioritizing? Who are the, what are the experiences that we're looking at and being exposed to then help mm -hmm. inform that foundational decision? And, and you made this point earlier that will go on to impact, you know, many, many people over a period of time, you know, could be years, could be decades. And those, those businesses, those designers who are setting themselves up, up for that, will be more successful in the long run. Yep. Yeah, I mean, it, it, there's a, a stoic principle um, called memento mori, which is uh, remember that tomorrow you could die and that changes yeah. your perspective and, and your like how you show up today and what, what you do today. Another good example is remember tomorrow you could have accessibility needs um, or you could be excluded from an experience, not just, I mean, because inclusive design, the way we think about it um, is is certainly rooted in accessibility and those sorts of principles and the things that will help people with specific defined accessibility needs. Um, things like, you know, like screen readers, um, the uh, contrast ratios, things like the things that companies like Stark are doing an incredible job of empowering designers um, to do uh, better work and to have tools to be able to like meet basic accessibility needs on the internet, which is desperately needed. Mm -hmm. um, but like there are many other ways where people are excluded from experiences or not affirmed in those experiences. And that could be like the people that you see in, in the products that you're designing, the marketing materials that you're, that you're putting out there. Um, you know, like having, having positive um, affirming experiences in the world is hugely important. This goes back to what you're talking about with like being in Salt Lake. Like you didn't have other people who you had access to who had gone down this path that would inspire you, provide yeah. mentorship for you, et cetera. So you like need to be able to see those things to know what's even possible in the first place. And then when you go try those things, you need to be included in those experiences in order to have access to them. So, um, oh man, I forget where I was going with this. Uh, no, but no. Uh, uh, go ahead. No, as you can say, I, I really, I mean, I think it all kind of comes back to that, which is that the more that you are exposed to uh, and the types of experiences you can, you can open up and identify and like that, that is, that is setting up, that is setting a foundation for value. That is setting up a, you know, for, for value for the end user that they can get, if they have access to this and they're included in this, that we are tapping into unmet potential in a way, especially if it's never been done before, if it's a space that has never been included or has been, you know, excluded for whatever reason that you're again, are we deliberately cutting ourselves off, you know, as designers, as designers in the tech in, in tech field and industry, are, are we, you know, cut what's, what's the saying, cutting off the one arm to spite the other or, you know, yeah. what, whatever mm -hmm. the, the metaphor is, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's helpful to think about like one of the thought experiences we did with our team really early on in order to like both build our passion for this and to um, it, to uh, build empathy with people who have specific accessibility needs or um, need to be included in products that have been excluded excluded from is to like go back and make a list of the times you felt excluded from an experience, right? Mm -hmm. um, and 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 to think in the future and think about times you could be excluded from experience yourself. And that's a helpful thing to do, like when you're trying to convince leadership or other people, powers that be, is like you can do this sort of experiment as well. Um, like, for instance, like a personal experience for me is like I, I broke my back a few years ago and I, I went from being like a fully able bodied, totally fine, didn't have any like I was rarely sick, you know, spent most of my mm -hmm. life feeling really good um, to being out of work for a year, like. I had double vision because of a TBI for a good chunk of that mm. time. I like yeah. had all sorts of like auditory overstimulation things that were going on. I was in a wheelchair for a little bit, then with a walker for a little bit. And like, man, the, the number of times where like I had to do something that was like way harder to do was overwhelming. Right. Mm. And, uh, you know, like this last summer I got COVID and then like, I got this insane bacterial infection in my ears yeah. that gave me the worst 
uh, ear infection I've ever had in my life. And it was so bad that I was effectively deaf for two months after I had COVID. And I still like I'm dealing with it afterwards. But like I would be in meetings with people and like depended heavily on the screen reader in Google Meet to be able to even do my job. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So being able to like go to times like it doesn't have to be that extreme, but think about times where you were ex excluded or felt excluded from a particular experience and how that made you feel internalize that and sit with it and then let that passion drive you to say okay i'm gonna like go find specifically the people who could be excluded by the thing i'm building and i'm gonna include them because i i can empathize with them now and i mm. want them to be a part of the experience of building this product yeah yeah getting back to again like i think sometimes we have a hard time seeing outside of our own experiences but in anytime you you look beyond your your current experience or your lived experience to be inclusive of someone else's experience, like it's going to, it's going to move the, the needle in a positive direction, whatever comes out of it, that we're constantly sort of being influenced by those experiences. And that is coming out in our work and in our priorities and values. And the, the future work that we will do will be built on top of that, that knowledge of those experiences. So, you know, I, I like this story because I think one of the things I wanted to touch on as well is that not just in terms of the, the practice of inclusivity design on the work, but how you're bringing you know, inclusivity to your daily practice and to the, that of your team and your community and maybe just give you an opportunity to sort of talk about some of those things that you're doing to sort of grow the thought uh, leadership around inclusivity, um, how you're trying to get, you know, help other people be aware and to make it a part of their daily practice. Talk to us a little bit about some of the things you're doing. You mentioned the blog posts and some of the other yeah. things that you've done on mm -hmm. the site. Yeah. What are some of the other programs or activities that you do with your team or with the community to help further you know, the knowledge uh, of, of inclusivity in design? Yeah, uh, good question. Um, we talk a lot at OM about how we have to have inclusive design as a part of our DNA from the ground up. Um, and that it can't be this afterthought or this thing that you bring to some projects or not. It has to be something that you think about. Like it has to be a part of everything you do, how you design your hiring processes, how do you design your day-to-day -day cultural touch points with your team, um, how you present yourself to the outside world and attract the, the right type of talent, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And in fact, like, um, how we landed on inclusive design is something that we care about so deeply as a company was by doing archaeological work and soul searching about what already existed at the company. Um, and then saying, okay, this is something that already exists in our DNA. And we've sort of like cared about it intrinsically and it's affected the decisions we've made in building the company. It is something that we can put a finer point on and pursue as a company as a result. And one of the reasons I joined OM in the first place, one of the many reasons was I looked at the company, I was like, this is an incredibly diverse group of people. Like it's not just the typical person that I see in leadership at every agency or not every agency, but a lot of them. Um, yeah. And and the diversity of the company and the people who worked there, um, I was really impressed by. And I was like, There's, this doesn't happen by accident. Um, this happens by intentionality and by like building the type of company over time that attracts that kind of person and keeps them there. So that's one of the reasons I joined in the first place. Then when we were doing a lot of the like soul searching anthropological and archaeological work in ourselves to find out what do we care about, inclusive design was already a part of how the company was designed in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, so we already had some things like an office hours program where like we cared about increasing access to design to people who may or may not have as much access as others who may be ex ex historically excluded communities from especially product design and tech mm -hmm. um, through things like not having access to the right types of education, et cetera. And so before we even decided this, we already had an office hours program that was designed to mentor um, people from those communities. And we partnered with other companies that were doing similar things to say, who are you currently working with that we could bring in and do apprenticeships or internships with, mm. or do mentorships with, um, to help and like put extra gas on the fire of what you're already doing. Yeah. Um, we had like a pro bono program. We were able to work with other companies that wouldn't be able to historically afford our services because product design is a fairly expensive thing to engage with. So we already had a program for that. Um, we were already partnering with a company in Baltimore called Dent Education that services communities in Baltimore and gives access to, 
to all sorts of types of education and tools and resources that didn't exist. You should support them if you don't know anything about them. Go to Dent Education and check them out. They're amazing. Um, <clears throat> so that was already a part of our DNA. And then once we decided this is a thing we really care about, now every quarter we're deciding like, okay, what are the most important ways that we can improve the design of the company to be more inclusive to the people who work here and to the people who, who would want to work here? Um, and how could we improve our current organization? And so being very fair and open and transparent, we're th like th in the thick of this journey. Like we are mm -hmm, not, mm -hmm. we have not figured it all out. Our company still has a lot of work to do. Our processes still has a lot of work to do. And I fully bought into the idea that like, I'm going to work on this my whole life and it's still going to have lots of work to do. Right. Yeah. Uh, that's yeah. part of like the humility of saying like, this is something that we, uh, th this is something that like is, is going to change because people change and mm -hmm. needs change and, and new needs for who's in excluded or included is going to change. But hopefully by working together, and by making it a priority, the world becomes more and more and more and more inclusive. Yeah. And over time, like we have live in a drastically different society than we did before. Yeah. I mean, I mean, even just you, you mentioned Stark, but right, even going back, you know, five or six years, seven, eight years, like like this wasn't even on anyone's radar, right? And so teams like yourself, individuals who have made this a part of their daily practice, who have furthered, you know, that sort of awareness, you know, of these challenges and problems that we're facing, like you might feel stymied by that in the moment on whatever project you're working on. But over time, like those wins will continue to build up. And now here we are, you know, talking about inclusivity and, and design, you know, as part of kind of this platform and, and others and you uh, and your company taking advantage of, of others as well to get the word out to, to bring people in, you know, to be transparent, to, to help them along and to take those experiences themselves. And, you know, that network effect you were saying, you know, how our brains like actually work in that more sort of connected and networked uh, way, which is how we organize as a society, right? Um, they can take that out there as satellites and, you know, bring it to their team and to their practice, daily practices and on and on. And then, yeah, who knows what we'll be in 10 years, 20 years, right? With all of this stuff. Hopefully we will, I mean, they include more people and be more inclusive and that will will pay off. And, and again, I think we've already seen that uh, at play and at work. And it's just like, can we can we just change what we prioritize and how we focus to really bring that you know more into to our consideration? So I really love that. Um, there's a question from Brandon. I want to get in before we wrap up here, which I think is yeah. a great one. Uh, so Brandon uh, Mejias, I want to say in the chat, hopefully I got that correct, Brandon. I'm sorry if I did not. Um, so we talk, you mentioned Web3. So how does Web3 in the metaverse uh, present uh, present challenges you know, for inclusivity? And are, there, and are there some barriers that you're already sort of thinking about that are that will be there and will to, you know, to, to, that will exclude people? Or are there opportunities to be more inclusive, like in those virtual spaces? Has, have you and your team thought about, about that at all? Yeah, um, it is definitely a hot topic of conversation because we work with a lot of um, startups or pre-seed companies and we have worked really hard to figure out like how do we make inclusive design a part of our process that is still affordable and that doesn't scare people away like a lot of folks um, at in early stages have a hard time understanding like why should I pay for things like user research or usability testing or I mean like yeah. they, they just give me the design I got to get out of here <laughs> and I need yeah. it as fast as I can as cheap as I can so we've worked really hard to figure out how do we still bring these principles because it's going to help them avoid a lot of issues in the future. But um, so we talk a lot about this sort of thing because there are a lot of companies uh, newly founded in the last few years and as a lot of layoffs have happened and then folks are founding brand new companies as a result. Um, how do we work with AI, Web3, VR, crypto, et cetera, in a way that still applies these principles? What are the dangers? What are the upsides? Um, I mean, I, I remember like, very early on in the Oculus days, getting a demo of that, um, like right after it had been acquired by Facebook and and being at their offices and doing one of those demos. And just be, the first thing I thought of when I walked out of the room was, you know, like, I think the thing that I'm most excited about for something like VR is the ability for us to have very close interactions and experiences with people and societies and people who think differently from us, who have different needs from us that has not existed previously. Like, there's a really famous example of a VR experience where you sit in a room or you sit at a, uh, at a bar in a cafe and you experience racial slurs from people around you to help you understand like what that feels like. 
Um, those are the types of experience of like having empathy for other human beings that drives you to create better products that I'm really excited about. Um, so that's an optimistic view mm -hmm. of, of what those sorts of things and that sort of, sort of technology can help us do. Um, I think the danger of, of emerging technologies and investment dollars and the, um, desire to move as quickly as possible is that we, we don't always stop to think about who are the people we're excluding from these experiences? What are the yeah. potential impacts on society that we should be considering? And there's such a, a like a FOMO, like I gotta get, if I don't get here, someone else is gonna do it, right? Yeah. Kind of thing yeah. where the impact to the people you're building for or society or the decisions you could make that could destroy your business because you didn't consider the right types of things up front and didn't build a product that actually solved problems for real people and therefore people were willing to pay for it. Um, mm -hmm. Like there are things you, there's mistakes you can do that can both negatively impact society and can negatively impact or put yourself out of business because you didn't take the time to stop and think about the problems you were solving and who you're solving it for and making sure you're doing the right thing. So yeah. that's the downside that I think I'm concerned about. Yeah. Well, great. Well, that's a, that's a great place to end on. Again, I think there's a wealth of more topics to dig into on this, on this side, but you know, Again, hopefully everyone goes and checks out um, some of your your writing and thought leadership on this. Maybe checks out some of these programs that we mentioned or some of these uh, resources. Super great. Uh, you know, I want to end with maybe maybe the question I ask everyone here, which is, you know, just quickly, what are three things that are keeping you inspired right now? What are three things that that you go to to sort of when the well is sort of creative well is being dry that you go back to to recharge and it could be design related, it could be anything else related, but what are those things that you always go back to that really are helping you stay creative right now? Is that a question for me? Yeah, for you. Okay. <laughs> 100%. Oh man. Um, gosh, I think first and foremost is, is seeing the need, uh, the need for solving real problems for real people. And also seeing the impact of our work for real mm. people is by far the thing that I'm the most inspired by the most often. And sometimes this comes in the form of just being inspired by helping our clients sleep better at night because we're solving problems for them that they're really worried about. Yeah, That's been one of the things that I've loved the most about working in a creative agency is just seeing the impact of our clients and then by yeah. extension, the impact to real people. That's super inspiring. Um, Gosh, man, what else am I really inspired by? I'm <laughs> always inspired by music, right? Like yep. always yep. inspired by music um, and have been like really diving into that. I bought a CD player again recently and like nice. have been buying CDs off of eBay <laughs> and getting inspired by those sorts of things. Um, and then I'm really inspired by seeing what other people are doing in other industries and being um, f finding out like, oh, th this is a really cool idea or this is a really interesting way to solve this problem that I hadn't thought about. Like, we were just doing research on like how Amsterdam was built specifically for bikes and how other com other cities have been inspired by that and making the city more accessible by mm -hmm. um, how they've um, laid out their city and, and restructured streets and how other places like Seville, Spain and London and New York are following suit. And then thinking about like, oh man, how, how can I apply that to product design that mm -hmm. is really different, but, but still really similar in how we're trying to solve real problems for real people. Um, that's really inspiring to me. Oh, that's great. Those are three great things. I know that I'm going to be inspired by and take that with me. Again, this is always the things. This is the thing that keeps me recharged is talking to really talented and passionate pe people like yourself, Ben. So thank you so much for your time. We got to wrap it up. We could go on forever, Kristen. So you better. Like, oh, now. I know this was so awesome. Thank you guys so much, both of you. But Ben, just your wealth of knowledge in the space um, is inspiring. And hopefully we've put at least thinking about inclusive design at the top of top of minds for many. So thank yeah. you. And a shout out to uh, Rob Young, who joined me in the chat and was All right, helping to um, to fill in some of the uh, resources that you provided. So. Um, so, yeah, that was great. Those are really wonderful to have. Thanks, uh, so thank you, guys. Thank you both. Ben and Talon. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe we'll have you back. I think there's a lot more to yeah. talk about. And yeah. also, uh, we'll, let's make sure we get together next time. I'm in, I'm in Salt Lake. I'll let you know ahead of time so we can get together. Yeah, please do. And if folks have like questions or want to collaborate or have thoughts or things that we could learn from you, just feel free to reach out. Awesome. Thanks, ben. For those still watching, we're changing things up a little bit next month. And we are going, we're taking Soda Series Live to uh, on location at South by Southwest. 
So, uh, so join us. Uh, it's a different time. I think it's going to be 6 p.m., 7 p.m. Eastern time, 6 p.m. Central time um, on the 13th of March. Uh, so join us then. We'll have a panel discussion with SOTA member agencies and a design leader uh, from Adobe talking about generative AI, hot topic of the moment. Uh, so hope we'll see you then. Thanks so much, everyone, for joining.